Welcome to the Ag Steward Masterclass Series. I'm William DeMille, and we are happy to have everybody on today. Go ahead and type in the chat where you're from so we can see where everybody's coming from, see how many international people we have this time. It's always fun to have international people show up. And I can see Bob Quinn. I'm glad you showed up today. How you yeah. doing? Thank you. <laughs> nice to be here. Thank you. So Jared Sorensen is on the road today. He's actually on right now, but his connection may be a little spotty. He's traveling. He's been at a conference. So I'm going to be on today, carrying on the conversation, and we will get going here in just a second. I'm letting a few more people in. Well, yeah, welcome, everybody. I just finished up at a conference of fellow ranchers down in southern Utah. Um, and the cool thing about it was, is it was put on um, in conjunction with the BLM, the Forest Service, estate agencies, and the ranchers. And there were about uh, equal number of agency people and ranchers in attendance. And they are all seeking to regenerate landscapes on a very, very large scale down here in southern Utah and doing some pretty cool things. So it was a privilege to be able to come and to speak to them and to share some principles of regenerative grazing and um, and also learn. Like my, I love to go and visit and we just got done with a range tour. I'm a little behind schedule getting home, so William's going to facilitate this meeting, but um, regeneration is happening on a small scale and also on a very large scale. Like these allotments are hundreds of thousands of acres, not super high productivity, um, pretty low rainfall areas. And so this context is going to be somewhat different than what you're going to hear Quinn, Bob Quinn talk about, but regardless, regenerating soil needs to be a priority for us and our businesses and also even as consumers um, seeking to buy products that are raised regeneratively um, and that's really when the consumer demand is there then I think as producers we will step up the game and we will really uh, we'll really see regeneration happen on a larger scale so with that, I'm going to turn it over to William and let him kick this thing off and we're just honored to have Bob Quinn here with us I met Bob years ago at a conference that he did down in cedar city utah and the utah farm conference and um bought his book and i think he even autographed it for me so we're just uh very grateful and honored to have him here with you and i'll i'm gonna mute and we'll let william run with it all right thank you jared so this is the ag steward Masterclass series and we're happy to welcome bob quinn here with us today to tell us a little bit about his story and his operation and hopefully get some good insights on how to make our own farms and ranches a little bit better so that we can improve what we're doing. Bob, how are you doing today? Terrific. We're getting rain. I mean, anytime we can get rain, you know, in the Northern Great Plains, we are very blessed and thankful. Yeah, that's fantastic. That That is good. It's supposed to be okay. snowing tomorrow, but, you know, we're glad for the rain because you don't have to shovel rain. So we're glad about that's that. That's right. That's <laughs> right. That's good. All right, Bob, go ahead and um, share with us a little bit about yourself and okay. a little bit about, you know, whatever you came prepared with. And we'll just have a conversation about stewardship and farming and ranching. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I don't know where you want me to start. I came prepared with my whole life worth of experiences. So. Um, I'll tell you, uh, I was raised near Big Sandy, Montana. It's north central Montana, about a town of 600 people. It was a thousand when I was going to school about 60 years ago. I was raised on a wheat and cattle ranch that my grandfather started in 1920, um, about 12 miles southeast of town. We're between the Bear Paw Mountains to the little isolated mountain range and the Missouri River breaks. Um, uh, so we have two uh, creek bottoms that go through our place. We're in a uh, short grass prairies of the northern Great Plains. So we're about 12 to 14 inches of rain a year, annual precipitation. Most of it comes in May and June. And then by July, um, things dry up. <laughs> so if you like green, we tell I tell my friends to come in June. Um, that's, the, that's the month you'll see it. Um, all the rest of the months are either snowing or dried up. But... Um, I had two great loves when I was going to, when I was 
growing up, one was plants. And I loved gardening and planting things. The other was science. And so when I went to college, I decided to combine those two. I went to Montana State University and uh, studied botany. And I was enjoying that so much, I went on and got a master's in plant pathology. And I decided I want to be a great research scientist. So I went on to UC Davis and got a PhD in plant biochemistry. And by the time I finished 10 years of college, which um, you think would have been enough, I'll tell you my folks thought it was enough, I'll tell you that. And um, I was a little disillusioned with academia, to tell you the truth. That was in those days, this is, I finished in 70, the middle of the 70s, 76. And it was all about um, competing for the next grant. And we were told when we went to conferences and not even talk to so-and-so in such-and-such lab and San Diego, wherever it was, because they were in competition with our lab in Davis for the same grant and the same money. And I thought, wow, that's a heck of a way to do science. I thought science was, you know, pushing back the frontiers of knowledge and and in a cooperative effort. And this was not cooperative. This was competitive. And um, I was, um, I, I thought, I mean, that's not the kind of science I want to do. So I decided to go home and go back to the ranch. And, and it wasn't long before my whole farm turned into a, um, to my to my laboratory and experimentation, and the reason the way that happened was that um, when we got home, we had about twenty four hundred acres. There was twelve hundred acres of cropland, twelve hundred acres of pasture. We had about fifty um, uh, cow calf pairs. Um, pole herfords were raising a great herd, and um, it was just the right size for one family, but it was really too small for two. And so we've tried to figure out well, what are we going to do to make a living here with my folks still on the place. And um, I didn't want to go to town and get a job. I came home to farm and ranch with my dad. And we already had uh, three kids with the fourth one coming pretty quick. And so my wife already had more than a full-time job. And besides, she helped me uh, with some of the seeding and some of the harvest. And I wasn't, didn't want to send her to town to get a job. So we tried to figure out ways that we could um, bring more value to the farm. And finally, after three or four years, we hit on, um, uh, well, I met a cousin of mine in Southern California who didn't have any work. And I said, well, why don't you see if you can find a, a home for some of my high protein wheat? Because that's what we specialized in. And um, we, uh, he took off and um, in a week he called up and he said, well, I've got a customer that'll take a, a truckload a week and he'll pay a dollar a bushel over market, which in those days the market was about $3. So we jumped our value of our grain by a third and just um, after we cleaned it and, and we paid, they paid for all the extra costs and then it was about a, a third more profit, that was huge for us. And I was really excited. And we um, took off on that and it went really, really well first year. And the second year, um, he called up and he said, hey, Bob, he says, uh, I think you can find some organic wheat about the same kind of quality as you got down there for that, um, you know, what's he been sending us? And I said, oh, well, sure, Jim. Yeah, don't worry about things. We'll have it to you in a week or so. And I hung up the phone. And I thought, my gosh, what have I done? I have um, i don't even know any organic farmers. In fact, I didn't even believe in this organic stuff because I had been taught all my life that a plant couldn't tell the difference between a, a molecule of nitrogen coming out of a manure pile or compost or whatever you might have, or nitrogen coming out of a bag of aborted sulfate. I mean, that had been my training. And so I was very skeptical of all this stuff. and But I, I didn't want to have uh, my prejudice stand in the way of, of giving my customer what they wanted. So I, I, I phoned around, phoned around all over the state, and I finally found a couple organic wheat growers in northeast Montana, about 300 miles from me. I drove my truck up there and got a load and brought it back and cleaned it and sent it to California. And Jim said, oh, man, this is great. Can you get me another load? And then another load. And, and um, pretty soon I was, I, I was probably scraping the bottom of the barrel trying to find what I could. And um, I got acquainted with a whole new group of friends. There were four or five guys that were in 83 or 84 now that were doing organic. And I went to one of their winter get-togethers, their meetings. And, you know, I've been used to going to uh, grain growers and farm bureau meetings. And, and it was mostly, woe was me, the prices in the toilet. And, you know, the government programs aren't doing what we need. And we can't find markets and on and on and on. And when I went to the organic meeting, it was none of that kind of talk. They talked about how when they walked over their fields, they could feel the, the tilth of the soil was, was, was much better. And it was softer. And it was changing after they started to go organic. And they talked about growing their own fertilizers. So they were really regenerative organic from the beginning. 
So they were growing legumes, alfalfas, clovers, and all these sorts of things in our fallow year, because we only grow one crop every two years where we are, and the second year is fallow. Instead of fallowing, they grew a cover crop of a legume, and that was their fertilizer program. And then because of their rotations, they didn't use any chemicals for um, pest control or, or uh, weed control or um, disease control. And so I was very, very excited about that and very, very interested. And um, I went home and I told my dad, I said, we got to try this organic stuff. This is very interesting. And we had you know, about 20 acres of alfalfa that was just on a little side of a field. And we worked that up and I planted winter wheat and we had a winter wheat field next to it, about 20 acres, all chemically farmed. And we compared the two. And um, at the end of the harvest, after the next year, the uh, organic field had yielded just about exactly the same as the non-organic field. Um, the protein was just about exactly the same. Both of them were about uh, 15 and a half protein and about 35 bushel is what we, we got that year. And I said, wow, look at this, dad. And he was, he was astounded. I was so I was elated. Here my experiment had worked. And um and he I said, Dad, look at this. Um, why don't we plant half the half the farm into organic next year? And he said, Whoa, 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 wait a minute. He said, We don't even know what we're doing, which was true, of course. And I he says, um, how about 10%? And I said, How about 20? So we settled on 15. And so the next year we went into um just um uh fifteen percent of the farm now was uh, in organic system and um we had a drought that year. And um, when we have droughts in Montana, we normally have grasshoppers. And this was no exception. We had some grasshopper plagues come in. And I asked my organic friends, you know, what do you do for grasshoppers? Because I knew what to do for the chemical control. You just put malifying all over everything. And a few uh, hours of grasshoppers are all dead. And everything else is dead, too, of course. And uh, my friend said, oh, no, there's a, 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 back, um, a, a protozoa called and a, and a product called Nosema locusta. It was a protozoa, which is a little smaller than the bacterium. And they put it on wheat bran and they spread it around the edge of the field. And the grasshoppers eat that on the way in. They all get sick. And when they're laying there dying and kicking in their last uh, throes of, of life, their friends come and eat them. It's just like politics in America today. And um, they get the disease and it spreads through the whole group of grasshoppers. And at harvest time, my organic fields, even though they had been eaten in about 15 or 20 feet, clear down to the ground. There's almost no grasshoppers in the combine tank. And the um, uh, chemical field across the creek had all kinds of grasshoppers because the malathion, you know, dissipated and I couldn't afford to spray twice. It was already a poor year, it was a drought year. And um, there was about half the tank was filled with grasshoppers when I combined. And I told my dad after that harvest, I said, I am done with chemicals. I said, we did the best we could. We followed all the instructions. And uh, the organic experiment, two years in a row, has done as well or surpassed what chemical agriculture had to offer us. So off we went. So William, that was the that was the start <laughs> of a long trail of experimentation. And um, but I never looked back, and it's been it, it brought fun back to farming for me, and it was profitable. And within three years, we paid off our, our 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 operating note. We haven't had one since. We were selling the crops for way more than the um, non-organic prices were. Um, we were uh, using a lot less money to grow those crops because we weren't buying our inputs. We weren't buying any chemicals and um, we were growing our own. And the result was we had net profits instead of um, you know zero profits and sometimes in the minuses. So that was our, that was our early experience. All right, fantastic. Sounds good. Uh, what is your uh opinion of certifying organic there's a lot of different um thoughts about that some people think that oh it, it actually lowers my standards of what i'm doing other people say oh it's a great thing to do what is your take on the certification well i was in on the, um in in the 80s uh, organic was just like the wild west i mean it was divided into camps there are four or five camps all across America. Every every camp said they were the best, and they were all different certifications. You know, and people would follow their certification rule, and then they put their label on their product, and there was so there was some verification of certification. Um, what was happening at the same time? Many states started to have state laws, and um, and and in a state where you had a state law, then organic was defined. Then you you knew what it was. 
But many states, um, Montana was one of the early ones. California was a leader for sure. And Montana came in with their state law in the, oh gosh, in the middle, mid 80s or so. Um, but some states didn't have any law. And so in those states, you could call organic whatever you wanted because there's no rule. And so that was really problematic. And there are several of us that were afraid that organic would go the way that natural went because it didn't have a definition. People define it whatever they wanted to sell their product. And uh, because it meant uh, everybody called it something different, it didn't mean anything. Um, and we were, we were concerned that we might go that way. So we went to Washington and uh, were able to put the, the definition of organic into law so that there was a definition that was the same for the whole country. And so when people went to the store and they saw an organic label, they could be assured of what it was because um, if you cheated on that, if you were um, you know, just using a little chemicals here and there, you could go to jail for that. It was fraudulent. And, um, and then people took it serious. And, and uh, you know, we're growing food that has, we're not growing commodities. You know, we don't grow commodities on our farm. We grow zero commodities. We only grow food, food that has high quality, that can nourish people, that can bring them health. And that is really important. That has a much higher value than commodities that, that where it's just focusing on how much, how, how big of a pile you can get in the bin, how many bushels you get to an acre, that sort of thing. I really think we should be paying farmers by the amount of nutrition that they can grow per acre. Not the, not the number of bushels, uh, but the amount of nutrition. That's what we should be paid for. And we can do that with regenerative organic agriculture, planting, first of all, starting with good seed, don't eat none of this GMO stuff and all this manipulated things that in most cases have really lowered the nutrition, but start with good seed, put it in good soil, healthy soil, and then put it into uh, harvest it at peak, at peak nutritional value, which for wheat, I mean, you do that anyway, because when it's ripe, it's not gonna, nothing's gonna happen to it. But with fruits and vegetables, many of them are picked green so they can be shipped across the country or around the world. And the nutritional value hasn't even been reached yet. And then the fourth, the fourth um, part of that is to process it as close to the field as possible so that you can process it in short time and not lose any of that good nutrition that you've worked so hard to put in and then not add a bunch of junk to it. Don't, don't get into highly processed stuff. Do minimal process that preserves nutrition and doesn't compromise. I mean, we don't put chemicals on our field. Why should we put chemicals in the jar of our processed food? It's the same idea. And so many of those chemicals are, really hurts your system. In this country, 60% of the country right now has a, one chronic disease. That's over half the country is sick. And it, it's getting worse every day. And the CDC says that 60% of the problem is due to the food that we eat. So uh, we can't, we can't go keep going this direction. We are on a, we are on a really a bad course. <laughs> if you extrapolate that out, there's not going to be any winners. But with regenerative organic agriculture, everybody can be a winner. So I think it's very important to have the label to get back to your question. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, not okay. Any compromise. It's not any compromise in my mind. It's a it's a um, customer guarantee that you're willing to say with a label what you have done and stand behind that with verification. In the case of organic verification, it's, it's third party verification that what you say you've done has actually been demonstrated to have been done. Yeah, fantastic. That's a great perspective, Bob. Thank you. Um, when you're talking about the food and the, the quality of the food, um, is there a way to test food nowadays um, to see if the nutrition is actually there? Like if, if farmers are going to get paid for nutrition instead of by the yeah. bushel, I mean, how do we know? I, I mean, I think I know that if you raise food in an organic, regenerative type of way, then I just think it's better. But is there anything in the works out there going on that you're aware of? of anybody doing actual testing to see, to verify if this bushel of wheat actually has more nutrition in it or, or this pound of beef or carrots or, or mm -hmm. whatever. There, there have been lots of research studies. They're starting to um, document this in all kinds of areas too. Um, dairy, um, as well as grains, and vegetables, fruits started first. I mean, especially strawberries was one of the early ones. And what they found with organic compared to non-organic was that there are higher polyphenols, for example, which are strong antioxidants. And um, 
The problem is, however, and so we see the trend. We see the trend, okay? And I'm convinced we're going in the right direction. But you raise a very important question and it's really the missing key right now. So if any of your, any of your audience out there is uh, really good in research and, and really you know, would like to win the Nobel Prize, I've got a great project for you. And it's just what you said, William, to devise a simple and repetitive but um, predictable and accurate test of nutrition. And there's lots of people doing all kinds of things around the edges of that. Some are doing um, uh, using spectrophotometry and saying, okay, we're going to look at these 50 compounds. And if these 50 compounds are at a certain level, then we, we think that the food is nutritious. We I, I don't like that very well because we really don't know which compounds are pluses and which ones are negatives. And, and we don't know the synergy of how they go together. And when you eat them as a, as a meal and, and how they interact. And is, some, is something that's been removed, is that a big problem? Well, maybe, maybe not. Is something that's been added, is that a big problem? Well, maybe or maybe not. But together, can they make a bigger problem or a better solution? We don't know that either. So we've done, we, and we haven't talked about this yet, but one of the things that we've done in the last um, 35 years or so is introduce an ancient wheat to the marketplace under the brand name of Kamut. And it was a grain that had never been hybridized, never been changed in any way. And for most of the 20% of the population, this is another problem that no one really wants to talk about very much. 20% um, of the people in this country can no longer eat modern wheat without some kind of a problem, a digestive problem or bloating or, you know, rash or headache or something but they have trouble when they eat wheat and um when they eat this ancient grain they don't have the same trouble about 85 percent have no trouble at all and the rest of the 15 most of them are the trouble they have is quite a bit reduced so we wanted to know what was happening with that so we started doing research studies i can't find any 30 well 25 30 years ago i couldn't find anybody in america that wanted to work with me with research because no one believed there was a problem with wheat because it's American, you know, we've got the best of everything. And um, it couldn't possibly be something the matter with something with a staff of life. I mean, after all, come on. And, um, but yet in Italy, where our biggest market turned out to be, they were very interested because the Italian folks, you know, they, if they couldn't eat wheat, which meant to them pasta and bread, they didn't just run down to the, the local corner store and say, well, I'd like wheat-free, gluten-free, please. They wanted to know why they couldn't eat this and how to fix it. And so those folks there were very interested in this research. And one of our first studies uh, demonstrated that the, the ancient grain was extremely anti-inflammatory. And when we saw that compared to modern wheat, which is a little bit inflammatory, not too much, but a little bit inflammatory, but this was extremely anti-inflammatory. So then we knew that all chronic disease is, is uh, linked to inflammation. And so we started studying then chronic disease. And we spent a lot of money. And these studies were, it cost, oh, I don't know, sixty to $80,000 a piece. They were clinical trials using human subjects that had these different diseases. So we'd, we studied heart disease in one year. The next year, we studied diabetes. The next year, we studied um, irritable bowel syndrome. We studied... Um, non-alcoholic fatty liver syndrome. We studied uh, fibromyalgia. And um, we've so far we've published 36 peer-reviewed journal articles. And, and this is uh, top-rated journals, not just you know self-publishing on the internet or something, um, that we were able to demonstrate there was a significant difference between, um, between the ancient wheat and the modern wheat. And because the difference in inflammatory um, uh, uh, effect of it, was like 30 to 45% difference. It was the biggest single difference. I had an idea to create an inflammatory index. And I thought if we could create an inflammatory index, it might be an indicator of how the body then reacted to a certain food or whatever you ate. And uh, that could give uh, nutritional value in a just a number from one to 10. Wouldn't that be easy? Just put that on label the product. And if you could have a, a, one to do with a cell culture, so it'd be cheap and, and quick. You could do it in a few days instead of these tests that it took us months and months. And you could do it for a few dollars instead of you know tens of thousands. Um, but but the but that was a great idea. You know, I like I try to have lots of ideas in case some turn out. Well, actually, that one hasn't turned out yet, <laughs> and we haven't been able to bring together the right combination 
with this cell culture, which would be representative of a living system. And you, you just put a little extract from the food or whatever you're working with. And then you look for all these indicators of inflammation and other things that are either positive or negative to the cells. But we need something like this, William, in the end, to really then demonstrate in all parts of agriculture, are we going in the right direction or are we going in the wrong direction? You know, we have lots of people selling all kinds of uh, magic potions that um, are going to cure everything if you put them on your crops. Well, what do they really do? If we could have an easy way to um, evaluate them with uh, nutrition in the food, I think it would be a huge boon. And then people could feel good about paying more uh, for higher value when they had a way to know that they were getting higher value. Um, and the plant breeders, imagine what a boon that would be to them, that they could, uh, in their plant breeding, kick out the ones that were poor in nutrition and, and uh, go ahead with the ones that were high in nutrition. And the, and the processors, you know, or we, we process our food to death so many ways. And uh, to have an actual number we could put on that can of whatever it is, process, you know, who knows what, um, and actually end up with a lower number than what we started with in the raw material, wouldn't that be interesting for people to see? Um, anyway, that's, that's, an, that's been a little bit elusive, but I'm, I, there's a lot smarter people than me working on it, and I'm hoping we can come up with something here in the not-too-distant future, because that could be the key, the key to drive the whole thing in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. You know, there's a lot of, like you mentioned, a lot of sick people out there, and they're looking for high-quality food. They're looking for foods that they can eat that actually, you know, heal the body. So I love <laughs> to what you're you're speaking here, and, and the people here on the call, um, ranchers, farmers here, um, a lot of people working with cattle, um, and a lot of people with crops also. Uh, so you mentioned Kamut, and, and I'm familiar with your Kamut and, your, and, and all that work that you've done. Are there other ancient grains, other ancient wheats besides Kamut that would have the same uh, benefit that you're aware of that farmers could be raising? I think almost anything that hasn't been highly bred to produce just one outcome like yield or uh, increasing low volume for the bakers as probably a good candidate. So I would go back to anything that was available before World War II. That's really where things started uh, in a big way for breeding and changing things after World War II. Um, if you really want to look at ancient wheat, um, there's einkorn, there's emmer, there's spelt, but you have to be careful with the spelt because it's been crossed with modern wheat. So you have to make sure you're getting the spelt that um, hasn't had that uh, crossing. And then there's heirloom grains uh, like turkey red and some of those that were quite popular before World War II. Most people say they don't have problems with those kinds of things. Um, and of course, wheat is what you know I grew up with. I grow that. So that's been the biggest part of my study too, because that's what we have been growing. But other, other things that have been changed in a very significant way, I would be suspect. And I don't, they're not, they're not guilty before before proven such, but I would be suspicious. And if we had a, a good test to just test test them, um, a, a quick and easy test we were talking about before, then that would be a big um, it would be a big benefit to all of us. But the processing, I mean, and for the cattle guys, I mean, the, a feedlot is a type of processing and it's mostly negative. What comes out of that compared to what grass fed is, is bringing you right off the range. And, 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 and all those different um, the difference in their fat makeup, all kinds of things that that change once they go into a feedlot. The same with chickens, the same with pigs, uh, for animals, but the, also the same with plants. When we when we just chemical them to death, so we kill the ground, so that they're just being fed um, by chemicals. I tell people the biggest biggest difference between a chemical farmer and a, a regenerative organic farmer is that the focus for the the uh, chemical farmer is feeding the plant. If they're you know a farmer and growing plants, while the regenerative organic uh, farmer focuses on feeding the soil, and then let the soil feed the plant because they can do it so much better than we can do with just a few chemicals out of a bag. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Uh, do you know any seed suppliers who would carry um, you know the seed for some of these ancient grains? And then kamut. What if a person wanted to raise kamut? I know that you've worked with you know, certain things so that if people want to raise Kamut, there's a process to go through. Could you talk to that? 
Sure. Well, one of the things we found with Kamut because, and, and the common name is Coruscant for, for the uh, Kamut, the Kamut is a trademark that we use. And the trademark means that we promise our customers that it's always organic, that it is um, high protein, that's never been crossed with any anything else, with modern wheat or anything else, and then it's pure. It's um, not been, uh, got other modern wheat mixed in at the, at the cleaning plant or the farm or anything else, because we inspect everything. We spend over half a million dollars a year doing chemical tests to make sure that it's chemical, you know, that aren't tainted with chemicals. Um, but anyway, that's um, that. That that's what we do. I, that's what the trademark means. What we found that this grain is really a very close relative of Durham, and so it grows best where Durham grows best, but not in the area where you have enough rain to grow corn. If you can grow corn. Um, with rainfall, I mean, if you're in the irrigation, that's a whole different ball game then. But if you have enough rain for corn, uh, you have enough rain then to bring disease on the on the Kamut uh, Coruscant, which is which really gets black tip very very easily. And so it was never in a it was it came from Mesopotamia. They don't have rain there. They're like northern Montana. They, it doesn't rain in the growing season after you know the initial after spring for them and uh, or winter and um so it's never had any resistance build up to fungus that brings black tip which is the blacking of the the tip of the grain the kernel and if you get too much of that the it's not poison or anything but it, it'll bring an off taste in the manufacturers nobody likes it nobody wants it so we don't really grow this grain um east of bismarck so east of a line through the middle of the dakotas uh, in Canada, east of Saskatchewan, we don't go into Manitoba. So we grow in, our, most of our growth is in southern Alberta, southern Saskatchewan, um, western Dakotas, uh, eastern Montana, and then just pockets around where it would have a very similar climate. So we can't go into the Midwest. And in, in Europe, we don't, we can't go into northern Europe. We can grow um, in Sicily and North Africa. We can certainly grow where it came from in Mesopotamia. Um, although it's a little the politics there, a little bit of a dice, dicey situation. We grow it uh, some in um, Australia. Um, we've had experiments in Argentina, but but using those criteria, and we have contracts in by um, central contract makers. Montana is Montana Flour and Grain, and um, in uh, Canada, it's um, uh, the folks in Radville that are are um, Perry. Uh, PHS, uh, Harvest uh, Seeds, um, in Radville, Saskatchewan. And they do the contracting with the farmers. And I don't, I, I, you know, I studied, Mon I studied Monsanto a lot, putting this project together. And I tried to do everything the opposite that they did. And it's worked pretty well. So, you know, they, <laughs> they take enormous prices for their patented grains. I mean, they're patented. That means no one else can even plant the seed back. Um, we think our grain is like a gift from the Lord. And uh, we don't own the seed. We don't own the grain. Nobody should own the grain um, that was found in nature um, as a creation, uh, as you know, something to be thankful for. So, but we do um, own the trademark. And if you want to be in the family of the trademark, then you need to follow the rules of the trademark and guarantee the public that they're getting what they're paying for, which is a higher value than mostly what they see in the, in the in wheat products. And so we... And in most cases, we're lending the grain to our farmers instead of selling it to for extremely high prices. And then at harvest time, we ask them to return that grain back to us um, as an incentive to, um, you know, just to help them out. Because the farmers normally, and I'm a farmer myself, so I know we're at the end of the stick. We have to, you know, the dirty end sometimes, most of the time, of the, of the, of the lollipop stick. And um, uh, I I, we wanted to set up a situation where everybody wins. Not that the manufacturer makes money off the farmer so they can make more profits in the end, but everybody works together to um, solve problems when they come up. And when the, when things go well, we can all enjoy a few, uh, more profits in that. So that's what we do. And people, some people really like to save their own seed. And we say, okay, you can save your own seed if you keep the quality up. If it's pure enough um, and it's not blended, mixed with anything else in your farm, that's fine. You can do that if it's you know good test weight and it's good no disease or anything, that's fine. Um, so those are the kind of criteria we have. We ask farmers to, so, you know, not all organic farmers um, are really careful with their regenerative portion of their operation. 
and uh, don't build up don't build up their soils the way they should. So we require our farmers to plant only after a crop of um, legumes or soil building crops um, so that we know that we're going to get the best protein and, and, and also have the best chance for success. So we try to um, encourage more regenerative organic agriculture than just you know organic all by itself. All right, fantastic. Uh, we have a question here in the chat, and um, right. Janet, Janet says, Bob, can you repeat again what you used for the grasshoppers? Oh, okay. It's called Nosema locusta. Um, don't, please don't ask me to spell that. It starts with an N, N-O-S, Nosema, S-E-M-A, Nosema locusta, L-O-C-A-S-T-A, -S -S something like that. Um, I've had a hard time finding it recently in this last grasshopper episode. And I don't know, I need to I need to put somebody on the search for that and see what's really going on. But that was a really the thing that convinced me to, to stop using chemicals. And now I don't see it as much in this, but that's what you should look for. And I know you can find it on the internet and uh, just see what happens with that. Okay, so you said that was a protozoa and you just mix it in with um, it, some it kind of grain? Comes, it already comes mixed on wheat bran by most manufacturers. And um, if you just spread that out, uh, wherever the grasshoppers are going to be coming into, it's not something that you wait until everything is infested and, you know, you try to beat them. That way, you can see gra grasshoppers are usually showing up somewhere um, outside of your crops before they come into your crops. Normally, they're coming out of the grasslands more than they are within the crops. But anywhere they are thick enough, they will, it was a fantastic control for me. And, um, but you have to get it early with all biological stuff. It takes time. It's not like a, you know, an instant um, a spray that kills everything immediately. Those are poisons. And uh, we try not to put poisons on our land. Um, and we try not to have poisons in our food, therefore. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what do you th think about people using Roundup, uh, the glyphosate? Um, it's a poison. It's a poison. Um, you know what it does? It um, disrupts a, a certain metabolic pathway that's found in almost all plants now before they started adapting. Um, some weeds have been able to adapt to that. But it doesn't affect human cells because the human cells don't have that, that metabolic pathway to make a certain amino acid that for us we get with our food. But for plants, they have to make it. And um, if they can't make it, they die. And so that's how it works. It's a poison. And... Um, not only is it a poison for plants, but most bacteria have this same um, pathway, so it, it kills them too. It's a um, bactericide. And so people say, well, you know, what difference does that make? Well, I'll tell you what, um, guess how many human cells you have in your body, and then guess how many bacteria live in your body, uh, in your digestive tract. Way, way more than you have human cells. You have bacteria cells in your digestive tract. And when you start eating things that kill those or start to uh, impair their functioning, then all sorts of weird stuff starts to happen. And it's really hard to track it and say, well, that's glyphosate. But now there's more and more research that really is pointing to one thing after another, that glyphosate is um, a factor in uh, triggering the disease or, or, or aggravating it or whatever. So it's a poison. And you want to eat poisons? I don't want to eat poisons. Um, um, and so I think that, uh, and now we have glyphosate in our rain. We're spending, there's so many billions of tons of this sprayed all over the, the earth is con being contaminated. The soils are contaminated. The waterways are contaminated. And now the rain is contaminated. So we have measurable glyphosate in most rainstorms in the summertime. It was less during the drought because people were using less. And it was more uh, before that. So I'm, boy, that's a hot button for me, William. <laughs> <laughs> So um, anyway, but for me, the, the tolerance for glyphosate is zero, zero. And people, you know, people, a lot of folks, um, a lot of good friends of mine in, in regenerative agriculture that, that aren't organic, you know, they, they're focusing on no-till and soil disturbance. Well, actually, when you kill things in the soil, that's a huge disturbance. That is soil disturbance also. And so rather than fight amongst each other on, on those kinds of things, why don't we figure out together how we can have both, both worlds. Um, we're trying to reduce our tillage as much as possible. But we haven't figured out no-till organic, but I'm not going to use a little glyphosate so I can do no-till. 
because I'm not introducing poisons to food that people then eat um, and then wonder why they're sick. So that's that's just my view of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, for so sure. Bob, Bob, isn't it uh, isn't it common practice in wheat production to spray glyphosate as a desiccant to terminate uh-huh. the crop prior to harvest so that it, it improves the efficiency of harvest? So I guess it's important, I think, to emphasize that well, one, wheat isn't GMO, and so that's kind of mislabeling. If you buy non-GMO wheat, it's already not GMO, right? Right. But that no does not wheat. mean yeah. it doesn't mean that it hasn't been sprayed with glyphosate. And how common, I guess, is it in conventional agriculture to spray glyphosate prior to harvest? Well, it depends where you live. In our area, it's not very common uh, because uh, wheat is is getting ripe in late July for the winter wheat and early August for the spring wheat or mid-August. And so we have plenty of time, but as you go further north and you start to run up against uh, maybe snowstorms or fall rains, it's a it's a big problem. And people that do are more are spraying for desiccation further north of us. Or um, also in our areas, sometimes if people have a big weed problem that just blows up on them, uh, they will spray glyphosate to take that out. But it's but that's that's kind of an exception, not the rule around here. For at least in, I can speak to North Central and Northeast Montana generally. It's not used to um, desiccate our wheat, but it is used in what they call chem fowl. So the year before, a field would get four or five maybe doses of glyphosate, and then oftentimes you get a dose right before you seed, and then you get another dose right after you harvest. So that there could be eight eight sprays on on a crop. It's going to go into wheat um, besides the sometimes uh, desiccation that takes place. But that's an enormous load uh, for the for the soil and for the ground. And we were told in the beginning, well, don't worry, glyphosate breaks down immediately in contact with um, the sunlight or it combines with soil, it doesn't go anywhere. Well, that's all a lie. So we were lied to again. And um, those things aren't true. Otherwise, we wouldn't have glyphosate in our rain. We wouldn't have glyphosate traces in our soil. Uh, we wouldn't have glyphosate traces in all of our food. And it's in, it's, it's in a lot of food. It's not just wheat and bread, but it's in um, a lot of food. Yeah, that, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time in a microscope uh, looking at soil. I do a lot of soil, soil tests. Yeah. And every time that I do, uh, like a, one of my classes and I have people come, I have them bring a soil sample with them. And one of the neighbors, they or, or a person that came, they brought a soil sample from their neighbor, who's a corn farmer, and they're and they're using Roundup, you know, maybe maybe once every two years in the rotation of whatever they're growing, but it's primarily corn and then a few other things. But there was absolutely no life in that soil sample, where you know just a normal chemical um, farm. Yet it grows a pretty good corn crop. But there was nothing alive in there. Normally in in farm land, I'm seeing a lot of bacteria. Um, In really good organic regenerative soil, I will see bacteria, um, good fungus, good protozoa, good nematodes, all those things in that soil food web. I'm seeing those in there. But it's interesting when I look at these fields that have the glyphosate in, you know, even if it's only every couple of years when they use it, there is, it's like it's completely dead. It's almost like it has high levels of some kind of a toxic metal or, you know, in there. It just killed everything. So I don't even know how the plants grow. Well, they grow because they fertilize them. (laughs) They're feeding the plants chemically. Yeah. Then that's where the question really comes down to, well, what's the nutrition? I mean, we have the bushels we want. We get hundreds of bushels uh, from corn and that sort of stuff. It's, yields are huge, but what is the nutrition coming out of that? Uh, of course, we don't eat very much corn. Uh, you know, a lot of it goes into feed and ethanol and that sort of stuff. So maybe that's not a concern. But if you're going to eat it, it should be a concern. And if, But if it's the same thing with corn, what, what about soybeans that are going into all kinds of stuff? And what about vegetables and other things where you're um, killing everything so you can add back what you want to grow the crop that you're interested in? But what is the value of that crop nutritionally? And that's why that having a having an easy test for that really is critical to um, using that as a general 
test or a general indicator of of what we're paying for and what we're buying in the store. We yeah. can we can yeah. guess the label. We can guess, but it's it's a and it's a good guess. I mean, you can you know, but but you can also um, feed a plant organically without feeding the soil in the same kind of way. I mean, some people do. I mean, hydroponics is the example of that. Um, uh, uh, blueberries in containers are, are an example of that. Um, and so I would be interested to what the nutritional value of that stuff turned out to be. And maybe it's okay. Maybe you can grow it if, you, if you're using compost teas or, you know, adding some kind of life to those uh, inert media that they're growing into. I, you know, I don't know, but we don't have, that's why having a, a test for would be so important and so much value to us. Yeah, exactly. For sure. Let's shift gears here for just a minute, a little bit. Um, let's talk about marketing a little bit. A lot of the people on our uh, on these webinars, they're trying to market their own products. Um, a lot of them just take cattle to the sale barn. Um, a lot of people are marketing directly. Um, some mm -hmm. people are trying to do like go to trade shows and that type of thing. If you could talk to that a little bit, I think that would be helpful. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, if you're starting from zero and you want some ideas, I would go to a trade show. I think that I love trade shows because you see everything under the sun. And, and a lot of times it, it'll give you an idea for something you don't see, but it's a jumping off place. Um, so I, I, I would really, I would really recommend that. Um, go to the internet, see what they're doing in, in Europe, see what they're doing in other parts of the world uh, with crops or with animals or things that you can grow. Um, then I would I would I would do some testing. I would I would oh I, I always start tell my friends to start small. Don't bet the whole whole ranch whole farm on you know something new. Start start a very small percent of what you're doing and learn as you go. Unless you've got you know millions and millions of dollars and it doesn't matter. You can try all kinds of stuff at the same time and still have money left over. But if you're if you're on the edge and the trouble now with a lot of agriculture, so many people are up against the wall. They can't afford a big a big mistake or a big um, loss so but but people can come together and try small things um i was just over to um speak at a group in west of the mountains here in montana by ronan and um, a good friend of mine jan tusik has um a processing point a plant there where they test and, and develop all kinds of new things and she was showing me a meat extender with um uh, with um, lentils for example so if you're, you know, if you want to help people eat well and eat good meat, but, but they can't afford the whole, you know, the whole bill for the um, hamburger, well, figure out a way to reduce the cost with putting something good in it like lentils, which is a very, very good protein. Um, not so much that it cha doesn't change the flavor or anything. It changes the consistency just a little bit, but uh, is what she was telling me. But um, it's still a very recognizable product. Um, I have friends over there also that were making um, uh, icicles, uh, ice cream, or ice bars out of fruit juice uh, that they had raised on their farm, strawberries and juice, strawberries and made frozen um, icicles or frozen bars with them. And, that, and the equipment for that was like five or 6,000 or 7,000 bucks. I mean, it was something way less than a new tractor, I'll tell you that, or you know, any, anything. Um, so those are some of the things that you can start with. Um, my goal, I, I always try to also look around and see what your liabilities are and see if you can turn them into assets. So we have um, terrible prairie dogs here and I, you know, that was a liability to us. And so one of my ideas was selling the prairie dog puppies to, um, uh, pet shops in Japan because they want small dogs. And if you sell them small and immature, then they can uh, raise them up and they tame them as they go. And it was, I think, a great idea. They're going to pay me $100 a puppy dog for this. And I thought, wow, this is great. And in Texas, they do this, but they suck them out of the ground with big vacuums and a lot of them are injured. And so by the time they get to um, Japan, they're all diseased and they're dying because they got infected with these injuries they got. And I thought, well, I wonder if we filled the holes with water and just use a fishing net to scoop them up as they swim up to the top. And then they're not injured at all. But I found this is, I was, I, and I don't have any legal background. And I found the logistics, the legal logistics of sending live animals across international boundaries 
was uh, completely a non-starter for me. So I didn't go anywhere with that. But you know, just things like that. They, who knows what could happen? Um, I was. We have saline seep in this area, so that's where the water breaks out, and um, in the middle of it, the, the salts and everything in the water. When the water um, breaks out and then evaporates, it leaves this salty area on the ground. And I thought, well, wonder if you planted vegetables along the edge of that where there's more water, but it hasn't broke out and make salt, so it um, uh, would kill them. Um, uh, that could raise uh, vegetables on the prairie. And I had uh, my control was to have some vegetables out in the middle of my dry land field. Um, and guess what? The control worked much better than the experiment. So I started studying dry land vegetable production. And this is something that all kinds of people could do um, on a limited basis. I couldn't grow spinach and lettuce and that sort of stuff, uh, leafy greens. But I, I could grow potatoes and squash and onions and even tomatoes and watermelon um, and, and all kinds of other melons just on the 12 to 14 inches of rain that we have. And all I did was learn to space them out. I gave them three times more room to grow than what you'd normally do in irrigation or or where you had gardens and stuff, and they did just fine. So there's all kinds of stuff. And and we have um, neighbors here that grow cantaloupe, and uh, they bring them into the store. And this is a real advantage. I wish we could do this. But the cantaloupe, when they're picked ripe, I mean, falling off the vine, have a most amazing, wonderful aroma. So when you walk in the store, you can smell them. And so you know the cantaloupe have arrived for the season. <laughs> And people pay three times the price of uh, California cantaloupe, which you can, you know, a rock hard and you can bounce them on the floor. Um, they don't taste, they taste terrible. Well, they don't, uh, maybe not terrible, it's kind of strong, but anyway, they don't taste anything like a ripe cantaloupe. And people are willing to pay, they chase the truck down the street in Great Falls when it first comes to town because they, they know what the quality is. That's the kind of agriculture we should be doing, producing food that is so good to eat that people stand in line to pay more for it because it's they know they're going to get a higher value. And you were talking about these fancy tests for nutritional um, determination. Well, guess what? We have we have two um, uh, scientific testers um, that everybody gets born with. You know that? And they don't cost you a nickel. One is here and one is here. And so if a food has wonderful aroma, and it tastes really good without adding anything to it, then you can be pretty well assured that it has high nutrition because that's the way it was created. We, everything is created in order so that we would be enticed to eat what was really good for us because it would taste so good. Um, and and um, you know, industrial egg and industrial food has kind of usurped that or compromised that, uh, bastardized that, as you might say, by putting in all these artificial flavors and, and aromas so that people are buying that and needing that and they're not really getting what they think. So anyway, that was yeah. too far yeah, off. That. But <laughs> it's the idea to look around and see what maybe somebody's doing in some other part of the country and to try it, see what you can do in your in your neighborhood. That's where I'd start. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. So yeah, my the taste and the smell, those are the tests we need. Unfortunately, you go to the grocery store and nothing tastes good and nothing smells good. <laughs> That's it's, the sad reality of what they the are. So the higher <laughs> percent of the people sick because that's generally what they're eating. You're right. You're absolutely right. And so when we find that, that's the kind of people we need to support. And we need to support the people that are doing that and however it's coming out. And be the kind of person that provides that kind of food. Yeah, right. Would, could you just really quickly tell us the story when you were in California going to school and you went to the peach orchard and oh. they had bred the peaches a certain way? Remember that story? Well, it wasn't a breeding. This wasn't a breeding story. This was a chemical um, industrial story. Oh, OK. OK. I, I love peaches. When I was a kid and, you know, some of the older folks will probably remember this, too. Uh, that aren't in peach country anyway. I mean, we're in Montana. It's not peach country. Um, we would get our peaches in a in a um, a wooden box, a wooden crate, and they would be double wrapped. Uh, one in a little bit of a, like a cupcake holder with a tissue wrapped peach next to it, and you could set those on your shelf. And in two or three days, they were ripe, and they were they were. We thought they were great, but when I went to California, I was studying in Davis, and we go out to the peach orchards, and of course, we were just poor students, and we tried to buy as close to the source as possible and canned what we what we bought so we could eat it all year round. 
And uh, so we went out and we wanted to buy um, a lug or two to can. And the orchard uh, director said, well, are you planning to can this afternoon or tomorrow or the next day? And they said, because you tell me what day you're going to can, I'll tell you what pile to pick the peaches from. And they had sorted them according to ripeness. And so if we can that afternoon, the peaches were just dripping, you know, and just so luscious and, and, and with great aroma that it was really fun to can. <laughs> um, and then when I went, so I, I took a class um, to see what the agriculture of Central California was like, because I'm really interested in that. We didn't have any of that in my biochemistry department. So we went into a, um, a cropping class and we went down to this peach orchard and they were they were harvesting. And I thought, oh, great. I'm hoping to get a you know, taste one. And um, and yet I couldn't smell anything. I couldn't smell the aroma of ripe peaches, but they looked beautiful on the tree. They looked like they were ready to eat. And um, and my professor, the, the professor driving the or leading the group, and the farmer were having kind of a laugh over that because they had developed this petrochemical concoction of some sort that they could spray on, so some kind of an oil or something. They could spray on the trees and it would cause the peaches to turn color and look like they were ripe, but they were as green as grass inside. And they could, and the beauty to this for them was they could pick these green put them in big crates without any individual wrapping or anything, ship them clear across the country. And when they got there in, a, in a four or five days or whatever it took, they were still in the same beautiful looking condition. No bruises, um, no mold, no nothing. And they put them on the shelf and that's what people bought. But when they got home, it, was, it wasn't fit to eat. And, and you know, I don't know if we were offered or had a bite of that, but it was, it was green, <laughs> but it looked right. So that was an industrial what um, um, sales pitch. It was the uh, cosmetics, and it was to make things look beautiful. And I mean, if you want a beautiful peach that nice, you should take a picture and put it on your wall because that's all they were good for. They certainly weren't good for food. So that was the first time. So William, that was the very, very first time I ever questioned uh, modern industrial agriculture and food. Um, production in, industry in this country. I had been taught all my life that all this is not only normal, it was a future, it was a scientific sound. And um, and this is what we should be doing. This is how farmers could make money and how, how we could keep them starving, how we could feed the world with all this chemistry uh, that people talked about. And this is the first time I ever questioned that. Um, and I never, really, I never really thought too much about it until I started those experiments I told you earlier for myself. And then I, then my whole attitude changed and I became a, a passionate convert almost immediately. Um, but even when I got back to the, to the farm, after that one experience, I said, well, that doesn't really apply to wheat. You know? I mean, that's, a, that's different. I mean, they're tricking us with this peach thing, but we don't do that with wheat. I mean, we're not we're just spraying the normal chemicals, <laughs> not you know, changing the flavor or anything like that. So... I, it didn't dawn on me what we were really doing until I started um, doing it myself. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that story. You know, it's just that seems so criminal to me to to change food in that way just so that we can sell it. You know, I well, I mean, yeah, I mean they, farmers they, do have to sell food for sure. Yeah, but you don't we want to sell good food? I mean, or, I don't it, get it. But but we should be we we should be paid for that. We should be rewarded. We should have the full value of good food. And and there's not a really good mechanism for that. The organic certification and the labels help with that somewhat. But it still could be it still could be better, and it still could cross all segments so that we'd have a real people people could make their own value judgments. If they saw a sticker that said this has ten times or five times more nutrition than you know the the dollar stuff. Um, it'd be a little bit easier to spend more money because actually for the higher quality, because you're going to save that by not having to go to the doctors. I mean, that's the goal to, to take the, the one, the, what, the 20 cents out of every dollar we spend on healthcare and increase the eight cents we spend out of every dollar on food and maybe add a little bit more of the food, but save a lot less on the healthcare. That's the goal. And we feel better and we'll live longer and enjoy life better. Right. Right. Okay, um, does anybody have any questions for Bob Quinn here? Go ahead and uh, raise your hand, and we will call on you. You can type your questions in the chat while we've got him on here. If you have any questions for him, go ahead and go ahead and let's ask. 
Bob, sure appreciate you being on today. It's fascinating to hear your story and hear how things are from the high prairie of Montana. It's fantastic. Well, I, I thank you for inviting me, and um, I'd love to share what different things what we're doing, and if we can help other people be successful, that's um, that's how I get paid. That's how that's what I, I enjoy. That's money in the bank for me, even though I don't don't see a nickel. Um, that's that's <laughs> money in the bank for me. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Do you have anybody who's ever um, got a uh, commute from you on a gardening scale, just for like, say, a quarter of an acre or something? Oh, yeah. Yeah. From time to time. Um, yeah. The, the trick is, of course, with grain, it's a little hard to harvest um, a, quarter, a quarter of an acre by hand. That would be a big project. Um, the um, So sometimes, sometimes people want to know, well, can I grow it where I am? And I said, well, just put a handful in your garden and see what it looks like. Does it grow up nice and and and, and pretty, or does it get all full of disease? That's that's the, the kind I really encourage to try that out. If they can only if they only have a quarter of an acre, I would find I would find a, a nearby farm buddy, <laughs> uh, a regenerative organic one, if you could. If you wanted to try your quarter of an acre, I would try it there and um have them combine it for you um, yeah that way you can get it harvested in a reasonable way for sure yeah, yeah okay we have a couple of questions in the chat um right. so, so larry wants to know how do we get to lease the commute how you get to what um at least the commute like how do okay, we lease it. oh yeah uh, yeah if they want to get commute from you how do they do that what's the process okay, so, uh if you're where where's he at is he in what? Is he in America or Canada or Australia or where is he at? Larry, where are you? Colorado. Colorado. Okay, that could be depending on where you are. Um, I'll tell you one thing I didn't tell you before. We haven't had very good luck with irrigation, not because it doesn't grow. Uh, so I don't know if you're in the San Luis Valley or someplace like that. We did do some experiments down there, but the it has a low yield potential. So the most we've ever ever got with this grain is about, um, I think, around 72, 73 bushels an acre um, on, on dry land. And that's when the when the rains came perfect and everything was perfect. Our, the, the normal is around, it's closer to 20 bushels. Um, but irrigation, when, when you can also tune in everything, is also around 80, uh, 75 or so is about as good they can get. But normal wheat, you can you're way way over 100 for irrigation or 150 or something. I don't know how high it can go now, but um, so we have done some experiments in, in um, Arizona with that. But with irrigation, it's the farmers are pretty disappointed. If you're in Colorado on dry land, um, uh, west of the mountains or east of the mountains, I mean, out you know going toward the prairie, contact Montana Flour and Grain in Fort Benton, Montana. Um, and they, and you can find them on the internet, Montana Flower and Grain in Fort Benton, Montana, and see, get, get some, get signed up, see if they can get you some. I know that they've been a little bit short in seed the last few years of the drought. And so we're hoping to start building that back up, but, um, that would be the source. That would be the place to try it from. If you're in an area yes. with good possibility, then there's no reason not to try it. Okay. Um, my internet cut out. That's Montana Flower Grains. Flour and grains. Flour and grain. Yeah, Montana flour and grains, yeah. All right, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Good luck. Are you dry land? Are you irrigated? What are you doing? Uh, I'm a little of both. I talked with you at the Greeley Farm Show in oh, February. Okay, good. Or January, good. whenever it was. That was fun. Yes, it was. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, um, Bob, what is your vision for bringing back the younger generation to the farms and ranches? Well, have them be able to do something where they really feel they're making a contribution. Um, have have things set up where they can be, they don't have to send the wife and the kids and everybody to town to get third and fourth, fifth jobs. Have things set up where they can earn their own living on farming and ranching if that's what they want to do. Um, don't be taken in by the the um, industrial chemical song and dance that says we need to feed the world and you know I'm going to help you do it and but you can hardly survive financially. Um, 
try to do something that's worth has a little more value and you can and you can uh, uh, capture that value and therefore make a good decent living at least I mean no you're not going to get rich no one's going to get rich farming but you can make it you should be able to make a decent living just like anybody else why not um, and you know our, our whole our whole thrust is that food should be our medicine and medicine should be our food. And so if that's is that if we can reach that, why shouldn't farmers be paid like pharmacists? And we don't have to be the top level pharmacists. <laughs> but the idea is that what we're growing is really of higher value than we normally get compensated for. And um, that's what we're trying to um, provide information for. I'm taking, I'm taking about 600 acres out of the middle of my farm now since none of my kids have come back to the farm. So I'm not a very good one to answer that question from personal experience. Um, although a couple came and tried some different things. One got hay fever and so they left. That was, you know, okay. That just happened. But so I'm taking about 600 acres and creating a regenerative organic research, education, and health institute out of the middle of my farm. And the whole thrust of it is going to be healing the earth by growing food as medicine. And not only helping farmers to do that uh, through research, but also through education, through um, field days through um, uh, visiting their farms and helping with specific questions, and then having health practitioners on board that that to prescribe food from the farm rather than pills from the pharmacy. So people can see the whole project, taking from good seed into good soil, harvesting and processing it minimally, teaching people you know, how to garden, how to how to grow fruit trees, berry bushes, and and then how to have a teaching kitchen so that you can teach people what to do with a turnip. You know, I mean, hardly anybody knows what to do with a turnip anymore or other things that you can get out of your garden or buy bulk in the store. And they're always complaining about the cost of everything, which some people don't have money to pay for all this processed stuff. But why don't we teach them how to buy raw materials and cook it in a process at home and then preserve it at home too. And you can buy in season and then eat either seasonally or, or minimally processed things or store them so that they can eat those things for the whole year. Yeah, yeah, fantastic ideas. Uh, what is your uh, thought on hemp? Should people be growing it organically or not at all? Or, Well, are you talking about smoking it or what are you talking about? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Richard just asked a question here. Hemp or organic <laughs> or not? <laughs> I think you should grow anything you grow. Should, you should do it regenerative organic. Not only for the crop that you're growing, but for the soil and, the, and, and, and not poisoning the earth and not poisoning the, um, the environment. I mean, that's that's good enough reason right there not to poison things. Um, we've been experimenting with um, fiber hemp and and the um, uh, seed hemp for CBD oil and sort of things like that. Um, and, of course, it's all organic. But um, I think that it's it's growing raw materials. And it's curious of hemp. I mean, you had hemp for clothes and all kinds of stuff we don't see much anymore that we could be doing. Um, and growing instead of all these synthetics and whatnot. And some of them have chemicals in them that aren't good for you, but they can do the same with organic, but they should learn how to, to make stuff that goes on your skin without chemicals that go on your skin. Um, that's just my feeling about that. Right. Okay, fantastic. Uh, do you have a direct sales website? Janet's asking. Well, our, our snack... So I sold all of my companies. Now I had a a snack food company that we make uh, crack and kamut snacks. We're just uh, frying it and then uh, the grain in um, safflower, high oleic safflower oil, which we also grew on our farm, and um, add a little salt to it. So they they have a website called Crack and Kamut. Um, I had an oil company called the Oil Barn. I know that they had hard times with the trout, so they don't have any extra. But check with them after this next crop and see if they don't have any extra. We're growing high oleic safflower, which is uh, high in oleic acid, which is a monounsaturated fat, and really good for your heart and, and, and your health. And we were um, selling that to um, University of Montana and Montana State University, providing all the fry oil. And then we we're starting to get back some of the used oil and then just clean it, we dewater it and filter it and centrifuge it and get the big stuff out. And we can get it down to 10 microns for filtration, went through a 10 micron filter, I should say. And then we can put it in our diesel tractors and we could run the tractor with this used oil. And if you can sell your crops twice, you're talking about adding value, that really helps. Uh, whenever you can sell anything twice. And um, and then it was a complete uh, cycle in, in as far as carbon also uh, use in your farm, um, taking what you grew and then using it for fuel. 
So there's things like that too that we can do and, and look for. But um, I don't have a big, so I'm not really doing business myself anymore. I've sold all my businesses and I started this nonprofit. I, I may, my wife made me promise I wouldn't start any more new businesses, but I figured a nonprofit's not really a business, right? So I'm not doing all the websites for sale and that kind of stuff anymore. Yeah. You yeah. can find stuff on the internet. You can find it, of course. Okay. All right. Great. So Benton says, um, we are a small 300 acre farm, Northwestern Nebraska. We operate organically, but are not certified because we haven't been able to justify the cost of certification at our scale. I've been interested in commute for several years. Curious if you have any suggestions or comments. He's a big fan and they've listened and he's listened to your book a couple of times. Oh my. <laughs> Well, they do have, um, at least Montana, I think most states, I, I I would check with the Department of Ag in Nebraska and see if we can get some cost share on your on your certification. Um, it depends. In, at least in Montana, they allow up to $750 for cost share. Um, anyway, that would be one thing you could look into. And also, well, I don't know what, there's some other, there's some other help, so that kind of stuff too. But um I would, um, I would for three hundred acres. If you could, I would suggest looking at some some way to get a higher value return on that that would pay for your your cost share for certification. If that's what the market is you're looking at, um, if you if you could grow something that um, somebody really wants, like a Miller or something, I wouldn't be bashful to ask them to help you with their cost share. I mean, they're the ones that are benefiting benefiting from it why couldn't they help you with some of your um uh potential um customers it never hurts to ask the worst they can say is no and then you're not any worse off but they might say well we could help a little bit but what if you had two or three that helped a little bit then pretty soon you'd have the whole thing paid for yeah yeah fantastic yeah, yeah. use your name specialize what you're doing i mean use your name of what you've done and, and you can be proud of that i know you're i'm sure you're the kind of guy that is anyway but um and and invite some of your customers to help you. Yeah, perfect. All right, Kay is asking how difficult it it how difficult is it to find good farm workers that understand your regenerative regenerative farming style. Hmm. How difficult? Well, let's see. Well, you know about pounding square pegs and round holes. <laughs> It's, it's kind of like that. Um, that is a big challenge. And it's not, you know what? It's not only a challenge for farmers. It's a challenge almost everywhere right now. All my friends, that if you want to talk about a common problem, a common problem that almost everybody has is finding good help. Um, and I don't know. It's not an easy solution to that. You know what? I, I went to, one of the things I did to find good help is went to the next state. <laughs> because um, when you're, like you're, if you're from a big town like Great Falls, and no one wants to come to a little piddly pope dunk town like Big Sandy, um, but if you're if you're in a big city somewhere in a neighboring state or two states away, and um, and you show them pictures of the mountains and catching trout and you know riding horseback across the prairie in the plains and in the woods, and having picnics along the river, stuff like that that that, that they don't have any access to. Then I've, I've found some pretty good helpers that have wanted to escape um, and they're good workers, but they want to escape where they are now and get into something that's a little less crazy. And um, that's, that's worked pretty well for me. Um, I'm not, for my, for my institute, I had got friends at Montana State that one friend that taught there and he said, I got a kid in my class that's the sharpest kid I've seen in 30 years. I said, okay, I want to talk to this guy. <laughs> So, you know, you, if you can put your resources out um, and find, there are, there are some, there are people, they do exist, but they're not easy to find, that's for sure. You've got to go hunting and you've got to um, have some helpers, I would say, in, 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 in looking, that's all. All right, fantastic. Uh, do you have a summer field day or events coming up where people could come to your place and learn well, I from? Didn't, I didn't think I'd. I was, but I was told that the uh, the Montana Organic Association had a field day scheduled this summer. I haven't even heard when it is. Um, 
that's going to be on our our new um, uh, institute. And so we'll start having those regular ones set up and going. This is our first season, actually, uh, first experimental season and um, growing season with that. And we're doing some things that I haven't been doing in my farm. I, I, I didn't tell you about my cattle operation. With my When I started going to food shows, my wife told me she wasn't going to be feeding these cows while I was gone or, or um, calving them out either. And uh, especially if it was 20 below or something. And I said, okay, honey, that's fine. That's reasonable. So I sold my cows and uh, leased out my pasture. So we haven't had cattle now in 35 years. And oh, I'm very interested in using cattle for uh, terminating, terminating my cover crops. And I've, because I've read and seen some things that, that people are doing with, um, with that. Um, and so with my institute, half of the cover crops now are going to be, I'm working deal with my neighbor who's got a couple hundred head they can bring in and we can graze things down in three or four days um and that's what i really want to do and then see what that's like so that's the kind of thing that we've been um uh looking at and kind of experimenting with all right good fantastic so uh the cover crops in places like um southern colorado and southern utah with with wheat they're all struggling to grow the wheat with a cover crop instead of a fallow. Um, and I know that Montana is very different than that area, but nobody's been able to crack the code and make it work down there. Do you have anything to say well, about those I climates? Would, um, I would uh, I would grow cover crops that you must have some rain during the winter. You have some rain during the winter? Yeah, I mean snowfall. Yeah. Okay. Well, snow. yeah. Well, that's but you go far enough south, you don't get snowfall. Do well, I guess it's high, though. It's, it's your elevation. Yeah, it's high elevation. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you're going to get snow. Well, what I was going to suggest is use use some of that early moisture or the in-between season moisture and then terminate your cover crops quite early, um, certainly before the, anything blooms. But if you're, um, if you're breaking spring in, well, some places spring comes in February, well, maybe by March or eight. We terminate ours early June. But if you can get an early start, maybe you can terminate much earlier and then you still save all that time uh, that the plant's sucking water out of the ground. Um, we've had really good luck with um, clovers that in, in rainy years, it would grow up six or eight feet tall. That takes a lot of rain. You might not get into that. But what happens, we disc, you know, it's six feet tall, we can disc it with a heavy disc and it leaves about six inches or so of mulch on top of the ground. And we just leave, let that sit all summer and it, and it prevents water loss and it keeps the ground covered. So it's not so hot. And then we will um, work that once in the fall and seed winter, we right into it. Um, and that really, really works nice, but that doesn't work every year for us. But the main thing that I would suggest is trying several, as many different things as you can imagine. Um, and almost see what's growing in the neighbor in your in your neighborhood. It must be some legumes growing uh, in the in the prairie in the grass. And I would look at those. Um, unless you're in a desert where it's just blowing sand, um, something is growing. <laughs> and I tell people to be most successful with regenerative organic. Copy as close as possible what's going on in nature in your in your neighborhood in nature. So see what's growing and what's you know when does it grow when is it green and when is it dead and when does it die and when when would things be ripe and um, I don't know if that's a very good answer but that's what I at least start that that works I mean in the native thing it works but to now when you start breaking the ground and cultivating you're you're introducing an artificial um thing but if you can mimic nature as close as possible then you have more success than if you don't you have to really respect where you're at and what you can do there um and in the most extreme places you you're more limited that's all it's just we're way more limited than iowa for example but i don't complain about that anymore because i can figure out what we can do here and i wouldn't pretend to, to tell the people that's in another area exactly the, the formulas but the principles are all the same. Right, right. Okay, where can people contact you? Well, let's see. Do you uh, have a I have a, a website now with our new institute. Um it's uh, quininstitute.org, 
my old my old email that still works and I check it every morning is um, Bob at quinnorganic.com. Um, my phone number is 406-868-5603. Unless you're coming up and it says potential scam, I always answer it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Fantastic. Um, there's one last question here. Yeah. Um, um, Kay is asking, do you do any teaching of your regenerative knowledge with children, young people, teens, adults, passing on the functional knowledge is so important? Yes, I it's, I wholeheartedly agree. And uh, that's one of the goals of our institute is education. So with the um, young kids, we so we want to have classes too, um, uh, hands-on classes and teaching gardening and, and uh, orchard keeping and berry bush growing, all that kind of stuff. But we want to have a teaching kitchen to teach people, as I mentioned earlier, what to do with what you, you harvest, but also, you know, how to plant, how to maintain, how to harvest and all that kind of stuff. And then have lectures that talk about general theories of, uh, of this sort of thing too. have week classes or whatnot. But for the, for the youth, I would love to put together a, um, like a, a uh, comic, not comic, but yeah, you know, comic book type uh, format that the younger kids would really enjoy and uh, put things in real simple, um, basic principles for them. And then, and then ratchet it up uh, for the uh, junior high and then high school can, can take the full load, of course, of what you're trying to teach, but have different levels for different um, age groups that could be taught even from the very earliest types of school. And I think that would really be good. I'd like to see um, this sort of thing introduced into the scout program with merit badges for organic gardening, for example, in the 4-H and have, have incentives at the, at the county fair for organic um, uh, production or have somebody to be willing to buy their organic beef or whatever, you know, guaranteed. Give them some, at least some advantage or some incentive to go into. We used to have at our county fair a, 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 make, a milling and baking contest. And I got, I was put in charge of that for a few years. So I said, well, why don't we have an organic category? So we had an organic category at the um, county fair for milling and baking. And so there's all kinds of places where you could um, have opportunities for teaching and also experiencing and, and having fun with it and winning ribbons and all kinds of, you know, fun stuff, fun stuff. Right, right. Fantastic. So that's www.quininstitute.org. Is that right? Yep. Quinn Institute. Okay, fantastic. It's just getting started, so don't expect a ten-page uh, a website. Yeah, there's only four, but um, it's a uh, it's, it's a work in progress. And if anyone has any suggestions, I mean, I would I'm open to anything. That last one was really great about the you know education thing, and we're we're working on ideas of that. We haven't got it all in place, but we think that's really important, and we're working on those. So if anybody has any specific things that send us to try out, I'm all ears. So. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Bob. Um, this Bye. is uh, this is fantastic. Certainly appreciate you being on today and sharing your knowledge with us. And uh, yeah, it's been good. It's good to see you again. Haven't seen you for a few years, so it's yeah, fun to see you nice and hear your you. voice. Sure doesn't take long to spend, uh, what have we spent, 85 minutes at your place, I'll tell you that. Yeah. 15. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll go ahead and um, end this uh, master class with Ag Steward for today. Uh, we thank you and we appreciate you and everybody have a good evening. And a good season. <laughs> thank you. That's right.